Okay. Go. Studio buddies doing a podcast with a little gay guitar. Hello and welcome to Studio Buddies with me, Simon, and I'm Jamie. And this week we are going to be discussing staying positive. And so first we're going to discuss uh, the different things which make negative thoughts and feelings um, yeah. affect us and why those things can happen. And then we're also going to try and go through several different ways that you can try and turn that around and make yourself feel more positive. Um, because we all have these feelings, we all experience these things. And it can happen for several reasons, but um, there's always yeah. ways of doing it. And if there's anything which either of us come up with where it seems unrealistic, then just trust us that we're not trying to seem flippant or... You know, we, we both know what it's like to go through um, serious negative times in your life. And we're just trying to relate our experience and how we've climbed out of it. So We're not trying to shove our positivity down your neck and be like, you have to do these things, otherwise you'll be negative. <laughs> it's just little, little advice nuggets that might help along the way. So you can either disregard everything um, or, you know, try a few things out, see how it goes, because everyone's different. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I'll start off with something which makes me feel negative. And this is maybe seem like a small insignificant thing, but it did affect me. Now, because I do a lot of drawing from imagination, I... Uh, I since the last few years when I've been at university, I've not really been working on drawing from imagination very often. And I stopped yeah. um, being able to draw faces quite so well that I would be able to do where I just have an angle that I could draw a face. And it would be a three quarter angle. Let me see if I've got three quarters, about a three quarter angle like that. And that's where I draw a face from or like that or, you know, something where it's an interesting angle on the face whereas now if yeah. I try to draw it it'll either be straight on or it'll be sideways or it just goes wrong and the proportions are off and it may seem like a stupid thing to get down about but that can really affect you when you think that that's something which is specifically a skill that you've yeah. learnt for, through you know trial and error over the years and I've now got to a point where I know I've got to pause beforehand and really consider where I'm drawing the face from because after our second episode I believe it was where we discussed aphantasia and I question whether or not I do have it I'm still not confident enough to say that I do have it but I'm pretty sure when I close my eyes I can't see an image which I'm pretty certain that's aphantasia so yeah <laughs> that's kind of I've got aphantasia so I can't I can't actually project a face and because I didn't realize I had aphantasia I would describe what I was doing as projecting a face onto the page, but it's more yeah. concept based. I discuss it in that episode, so look at episode two. But if I can't do that, like these days, where it's really like nine times out of ten, it won't be a keeper. Well, maybe not that many. I'd say maybe it's half and half, to be honest. To be fair, I can half the time I can do it, half the time I can't. But that's bad for yeah. me because normally it would be nine times out of ten I would succeed at that. Now it's, you know, five times out of ten, I can't do that. Um, and that's really a blow to my ego um, because, uh, sorry, okay, full disclosure, we had a, we had a false start to this, to this yeah. episode. And I was asking Jamie, what is the opposite of an ego boost? What did you say? And I said ego squish. <laughs> so that's what I just wanted to say. I wanted to say, like, it was a real ego squish. Yeah. I just wanted to incorporate it. I couldn't do it without laughing. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. That makes me laugh. So, yeah, it was a real ego squish to have that happen. And, um, and it does, it affects you. And it's just, it's more, it affects me in a small way. But it, then if I become really down, if the other things occur or I just have this slump, then that will, that will become part of the problem is that you can't yeah. 
draw faces anymore. You probably can't draw buildings from imagination anymore or just shape design is just not something you practiced or kept up with. So um, that will just be reinforced or reinforcing the negativity as just one element of being down when it comes yeah. to, um, you know, having this negative uh, negativity, you know, in your heart and mind. So that's my yeah. first... Um, kind of example of things that can get me down and make me feel negative but we will we will be redeeming this don't get don't get down folks anyone watching we are going to give solutions but yeah that's my first one what have you got i um i just want to like quickly say this because i think this would be really good like tiny sidetrack here yeah. anyone that's watching like if we ever get merch just a t-shirt with ego squish <laughs> yes <laughs> That's a great idea. I think that would be amazing. You know, like when we're one of those top dogs with like massive audiences and yeah. we're racking in the cash. Ego yeah. Squish t shirts. Um, great. <laughs> okay, yeah, cool. so I um I get negative quite a bit. I will admit it. Um and as I said in the first take that failed <laughs> My um fault. No, it's okay. Anyone that knows me personally, my my life is chaos. It's just filled with everything. Um, it's awful. A lot of death happens all the time. Um, he follows me around and I don't appreciate it. Um, if anyone that knows him, tell him to stop. I've had enough. <laughs> um, so I tend to get quite negative because of, you know, things like that, um, losing loved ones, um, and it's not great. Um, in terms of art and stuff, I do get relatively frustrated with myself because unless I'm in, like, a very specific head headspace, I feel like I can't do as well because if I'm not, like, 100% zoned in, hyper-focusing, as much as possible to the point where all of my bodily functions don't matter anymore then I, I notice more of what I'm doing it sounds really bizarre but I start to pay attention to the way I'm holding the brush the kind of marks that I've made and I start to nitpick it as I'm doing it whereas if I'm in like if I'm hyper focusing on it because of my ADHD I don't I don't really notice as much I'm kind of just like in the zone doing it like you'd have to bash me across the back of the head for me to notice that you were there um and that's where a lot of my frustration comes from um that and my issues with mixing color um if i don't have people around me i i get really i do get really negative about it and you know i'll say to myself like i shouldn't be an artist i'm colorblind I don't even know how to mix colour properly and stuff like that because I don't have someone by my side to be like, nope, you need more blue. Um, so I think a lot of my negative thoughts come from things like that. With my Aphantasia it's not so bad because I, I've i never really done stuff from imagination anyway. I kind of, I, I always use reference images. I've kind of found my way around that. Um, it's mainly just being colour blind and having ADHD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And people uh, dying. Uh, yeah, that is how I got to know you is um, finding out the troubles in your life in first year. Yeah. And I remember when we had to leave a lecture once. Well, not had to, but we kind of took advantage of the ability to leave a lecture once because it was obviously a difficult time for you. And we yeah. missed a talk by a close friend of mine who I love completely, as you know. And when we told her afterwards, because I kind of quickly asked her, I was like, do you mind if I tell her? And she just complete disbelief, not literal disbelief, but she was just shocked at the gravity of the pressure on your life. Because it was, yeah. um, and you know, things started tumbling, you know, all the faster after that. It wasn't as though that was a low point. It was as though this is the course that you're on at the moment as far as you know challenges that are, uh, it's facing. kind of been on that course for quite a while so like um for context for people watching um the 
the day that Simon was talking about, I had gone to visit my mum. She was sectioned. Um, she'd gone to hospital with a kidney infection and they sectioned her from there. So she was in a mental health facility. Um, the first time I'd gone to visit her, uh, she claimed that she didn't have a daughter at all. She didn't know who I was. Um, she was, I think she had a nervous breakdown, um, quite a bit of psychosis. And then a year later she passed away. So my life has kind of been on like this downward slope um, since I was a teenager. Like it, it started out with um, not a great upbringing, quite abusive, then being made homeless. Um, then it went up because I got this flat, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> then my mum was sectioned. Then my grandma passed away. And then a month later, my mum passed away. And then a few months later, my partner's grandma passed away, who I was very close to. And then very recently, his granddad passed away. So it's kind of just like this downward spiral that I just exist in. Um, yeah, but it's it's a lot. <laughs> It's a lot to be taken from you because it's it's yeah. a lot where you try to use these things as anchors to keep you, you know, um, kind of grounded with this is my security is that I've got my parents here and I've got, you know, my grandparents. I've got these relationships that I can rely yeah. on. And to have those stripped away are things which everyone struggles with and everyone's got a fear of losing those things. And to sort of see how how composed you were through university was why I felt so privileged that you'd opened up to me and was, you know, friends and would discuss it with me because other people weren't aware and because this friend of mine was upset that we missed her presentation, which I still, you know, yeah. wish that we could have seen her talk because I, I think she's a yeah. great, lovely person and got so much to discuss about art. But it was obviously something that was, you just have to prioritise what's important to you and uh, she completely understood, obviously. Um, but it was just communicating yeah. that to her because of who she was um, that was something where I think she realised how much unseen suffering there will be around where people just can't go around, you know, billboarding every problem they've got. Yeah. It doesn't matter how significant it is. And some, some problems are so significant like these. And you don't want to project that out into the world because people aren't ready to absorb and understand those things necessarily. So it was. I uh, just want to. Um, I just want to clarify for everyone watching. Like, I'm not. I'm not talking about this to be like my life is so bad. You know, like I want to share my experiences so that other people, like anyone that's going through anything, even remotely similar to the stuff that I've been through, I want people to be aware that you're not. You're not alone. Um, there are people out there that understand. Um, there are people out there that understand and haven't been through it. Like Simon, for instance, like he's been, he's been one of my closest friends since I started uni. Um, so there are people out there that may not have lived through what you've been through, but they can still be some kind of support system when you don't have one. Yeah. That was the point, not like, woe is me, meh, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, obviously my next thing that's negative that affects me is going to seem so petty now, because there's nothing... No, it's fine. Like that. I mean, the thing is, is that I have lost people in my life, but I don't necessarily just to piggyback on what you're saying to bring it up, because it's not happened for years. But I did have a run when I was young, when um, it's actually when I was around your age and um, three of my friends died in a year it was just insane because three of them didn't make yeah. it to the age of 21 in a row and they were all each of them were very close friends of mine and um, and they all died separately in, in weird circumstances but yeah. anyway sorry just to bring that up as far as uh, you know I can kind of that's not family but it's um, I mean I've had family things but not anything as close as what you've had and the same challenges and the same upbringing so it's never going to be equal but we've all had things where we feel like this is just unseen um, kind of you know life issues where things get taken away but some people just have it where you're just like I can't even I can't imagine what that's going to be like for me and it's I'm at yeah. such a different stage in my life that you are there is just yeah 
just heighten the fact that I appreciated your maturity and your sensitivity and your kind of uh, how clever you were about how to communicate these things. It was just really, it was a respectable thing. I really appreciated it. Anyway, so why my life is hard is uh, right. No, this is why. Uh, this is why I get down. Okay, I'm going to have quite a few, so I'm just going to go to this one because this is kind of a big one. Um, I might have mentioned this on a podcast several times. I don't know. I can't remember. But I've been in lockdown in one room for over two years now. And that is, yeah. that gets you down. <laughs> like, that's hard. <laughs> Especially when you're watching the news and the world's like, hi, we're back to normal now. There's no pandemic, apparently. So that's yeah. um, maddening to sort of see. And I just, um, I try to question whether or not what I'm doing is logical and rational and I just look to people who I think are not authorities but I mean there are authorities as far as I'm concerned like virologists and epidemiologists and then there are people who are super rational and just yeah. critical thinkers and skeptics so I look to them to see what how they're approaching the pandemic and I get reassured that they are in similar circumstances where they're just saying you know I don't do this I don't do that um yeah. Whereas I take these precautions, but it makes it hard to relate to people. You don't, you know, travel around and I mean, I don't travel around, I should say, you know, I don't visit friends. I don't have friends visit me. I rarely have as many phone calls as I used to. And um, it's just it's a tricky situation to stay sane, you know, to for lack of a yeah. better word, because you are in your own head a lot of the time and it does become a bit overwhelming to the um kind of isolation of it really um yeah so that's really been a tricky part as far as um yeah it's just a an unpleasant truth that, that i kind of it does get me down that is something where i i hope for the world to return yeah so yeah, that's kind of, I want the world to obviously return to okay. what it was previously, but until yeah. then I'm committed to staying in this kind of lockdown life and just hoping that something changes. But that's a very unforeseen thing, so so it's trying to ward off the negative thoughts, but, but that can be, um, I don't know, I have to admit that the drawing from imagination thing has actually affected me more than the isolation yeah. has, weirdly. So um, I think it's because I have control over isolation and I don't have control over how poorly I draw. Sometimes yeah. I just, it really bothers me when I just think, right, you know, whatever. I'll go into the solutions later. For the time being, it's just the problems alone. Um, is there any more negative things? Because I've got one more negative thing that I definitely want to discuss. Aside from that. Um. I think like as quite a broad topic for me in general is just my my poor mental health and I'll admit I have gotten a lot better over the years which is something that I'm going to talk about for the the positive side but you know when it comes to your mental health in general um even for someone that hasn't necessarily had poor life experiences it can happen to anyone and that's okay just thought I'd you know it's okay any kind of you know any kind of pain or suffering or anything like that at all it's all valid like you shouldn't let anyone tell you that it's not because their life has been harder that's a load of rubbish um but there are days where my mental health is still pretty bad um like I could just wake up one morning and be incredibly anxious or depressed and I don't necessarily know what's triggered it but sometimes it just happens and sometimes you know I find it hard to do the most basic of tasks um and that's okay yeah yeah and that is something which again is hard to it's hard to foresee and hard to control I suppose isn't it it can just catch you by yeah. surprise and things can just set you off in places yeah. where you just at the whims of your biology almost or your you know brain chemistry where you just all of yeah. a sudden spiral it out of control and i i have issues regulating my own emotions um 
and I'm not sure if that's I think it's partly to do with my ADHD and partly to do with my upbringing um, so there are times where I can't regulate myself um, I can't calm myself down I can't like you know try and make it easier for myself because I don't necessarily know how to um, but that's something that I'm working on and it's something that's gotten better over time and it's just about understanding it and not being so hard on yourself when it does happen um, because some people just you know they can't regulate as well as others and that's okay it's about finding those tiny steps that you can take to have some kind of control again and to bring some kind of happiness back and that's enough yeah yeah now i'm sure that that's going to be the most relatable point i think for maybe you know the majority of people who will see this episode will have yeah. had those types of experiences and either acknowledge them or not because a lot of people don't even acknowledge it and because of the stigma surrounded surrounding mental health still it's um, yeah. still a point of, of uh, issue for people where point of issue a point of uh, contention I suppose for a lot of people where they just don't want to accept mental health is a, an issue and a barrier for them but yeah. I, you know I too have to um, reconcile my struggles with depression and anxiety and um, I don't know what else until I actually explore it more and maybe get, get a mental health professional to help me diagnose what what I'm kind of dealing with. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up, though, is, um, and it is something which I've mentioned too often on the podcast, so I'll try and keep it brief, but it is my issues with the university course that I'm on and how that really does affect me negatively because I do feel as though I'm very much separate to everything else and that's related to the past the last thing that I mentioned the um, isolation which I'm in which most people aren't so yeah. they're just not you know they don't seem to uh, distribute resources to people working remotely as much as they do to people on campus or at all to people remotely um, there's very few there's a, there's a few things which are online but it's not it's not what it was in the second year where we had videos which we could access or meetings which we could attend that's just been taken away since this calendar year since 22 and um, yeah that's really been making my anxiety uh, creep in because I just think that the course for me is now completely derailed my education is completely off course and I don't know if I can still get the benefit my submissions for the third year and the degree show are going to be video art films. And yeah. And that's not something which I'm going to do as a career. I'm just not going to do that. Even if they're sort of saying, yeah, this is great, people are interested in it, I'll be like, cool, have fun. Because I'm going to be drawing and painting. The videos I'm going to make are going to be videos like these and other YouTube videos that I appreciate making because it's the type of media I really get benefit from is relating to people who are either on a journey of art making or mental health or sexuality or whichever aspect of life people discuss. I love to be able to pick and choose from these different characters online and get this knowledge from different people's experiences and the communities which are attracted to those channels. And I just think yeah. that that is one of the greatest things that I've found on the internet is that you can find really healthy discussions which just kind of inform people's um, inform people about different aspects of, of humanity which you may not have considered. So yeah the online course unfortunately is not what I enrolled for so that's not available and I'm having several difficulties where I'm just trying to discuss it with tutors recently a tutor at the university said to me to not call myself a remote student anymore because he thought it was inappropriate, which I just think is not important. It just seems needlessly pedantic and unprofessional for him to say, Yeah. I don't appreciate you calling yourself this term because the course doesn't specify anything for students under that title. 
I just don't have any anything to relate to. You know, I don't have anything that seems to be boxed off for someone in my position. So it just makes me feel makes me feel difficult. First, I feel like it's me. It's my fault. I'm the one who chose to do this. And it's not. I didn't choose to go the pandemic timeline. This is just what we found ourselves in. And then this yeah. is the way that I thought was the most responsible way to keep everyone safe, not just myself. And then the course, I'm just stuck. I'm trapped on this course. So that's a real negative aspect of my life. It really gets me down a lot of the time is thinking about how that um, how that's going to play out and how that is playing out at the moment uh, is not who I want to be as a person and it's not how I want to affect other people around me and my relation to other people on the course is really quite bad at the moment because uh, yeah. obviously people aren't in the position so that is my other negative thing is there anything else that you want to discuss as far as the negative aspect of what makes you go down and what really is a problem um my job um i work in retail um i'm only part-time i only do um two days a week but since working there i've realized that people can be very horrible um and yeah it it brings me down because people come in and they think that you owe them everything you have to do everything for them and you know some of the interactions i have they can be really horrible and i'm just there to earn money like i'm just there to live essentially um and it's made me realize that working in retail i don't want to do it for much longer because i i really don't enjoy it and it's made me realize how entitled people feel that they are um yeah. they they come in thinking that they're entitled to absolutely everything um they can talk down to you because you just work there you're not important and um, on top of that like the customers can be bad and the management is also bad um they just see you as a number they don't care about um any of your problems um, because like I mentioned earlier, um, after my mum had passed away, um, they had penalised me and tried to give me a disciplinary because of the, um, the amount of sick, um, absences that I had. I was off work for, I think it was about two months, and they tried to give me a warning because of it, um, after my mum had died, which is absolutely disgusting. Um they don't care about anything like that they they just want you there to work and i understand that it's a business and that you know they they pay you but when you've got so much rubbish going on in your life it's kind of it's hard to go back to mainstream work and pretend like everything's fine when it's not um and you know the amount of times that i've requested holidays for things and like i i tried to book off the weekend for the degree show because i know that it's going to be open over that weekend and we can go there and actually like sell our work through the exhibition so i wanted to be there to meet people talk to people and i put in my holiday request like my final degree show for uni and they just denied it because apparently me going into Sainsbury's and serving old people is more of a priority than trying to sort out my career as an artist. Um, which is really, really infuriating. Um, they don't care about any kind of mental health. Like they, they harp on constantly about like, oh, you need to look after your mental well-being. And it's like, well, you're the reason that my mental well-being isn't great. Um, because they expect me to do like three people's jobs by myself on an eight hour shift without crying um, and then when I say something um, I get into trouble because I can't be disrespectful to management like that um, which I can um, and I have <laughs> because I think it's absolutely appalling um, but yeah working is is a big one um, and 
I was hoping to do my masters this year but I can't um, because I missed the submission um, <laughs> for my application so I'm either gonna have to work there um, pretty much full time to afford to live because council tax and bills are expensive or I'm gonna have to go somewhere else um, which is going to be quite difficult as well because there aren't really that many jobs currently. Um, a lot of people during the pandemic had redundancies and stuff like that so the job market really isn't that large currently. Um, no. And the thought of that makes me quite negative because yeah. I was hoping to start like my career as an art therapist um, and it's having to be pushed back which is quite sad really <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, you've put a lot of work into this as well so you you deserve this position i mean that's not how you get to be an art therapist is like you deserve it but i know that you've put in the work you know that you've done a hell of a lot and you've split your time up i mean that friend yeah. of mine who i mentioned earlier she asked you know whether you know what you were doing and i said to her that you were still working and she was shocked that you were a full-time student part-time working and you were doing stuff in communities outside of that as well, as far as to do with mental health, to do with certain conditions and to make sure that, you know, you were connected with things that are relevant to your life and to others. And yeah. I'm going to make a point of I'm not going to bleep out when you said Sainsbury's because I, I think that they need the shame and calling out for how poorly they treat their staff. And it's not only Sainsbury's because I've worked at Sainsbury's, I've worked at Asda, and I just think we could do a whole episode on retail nightmares because oh, the stories God. we could both share, <laughs> things that customers have said and things that you find yourself saying because it changes who you are as a person being forced to go into this place where you're treated so poorly. I'll just quickly share one story where I didn't even work in this place. I was just a customer um, working. I was working at a dental laboratory at the time. This is before university. And I was in Tesco and there was a young woman stacking shelves. She was on the floor, as you do, you know, because this is the type of job that you signed up for is that yeah. she was kind of sat, sat, lay on the floor, stacking things on the shelf. And a manager or well, supervisor or whatever the hell he was came up. He was like, um, Sarah, um, please. Yeah. And just walked off and my impulse towards violence takes a while but not when that type of thing happens. I just, I wanted to do that whole move of snapping someone's head, you know, just grabbing yeah. the thing, you know. <laughs> I'd just be so satisfied to go, uh, Sarah, you can take the rest of the day off with full pay, thank you. Yeah. You know, it's just, people just don't deserve that type of horrible, demeaning treatment. To have someone click their fingers at you. I've worked one job where, and it wasn't a supermarket, but I worked a job where when I tried to talk to someone, they put their finger up to me as if to be like, wait, you wait for my thing and that is so horrible to have someone do yeah. that to you i've only had that once and uh well i um to, to snap the finger i get clicked at i get whistled at um i get the at least every shift um every really? shift there's one person that'll do that that and whistle at me oh, yeah God. Yeah, um, we went to my partner's mum's over Christmas and she knows how much I hate my job. And um, I, I'll admit, we had a bit to drink and I like I went on this rage fueled rant about work and everyone around me was just like weeing because it was <laughs> so funny. But these are real things that I've had to deal with and yeah. it just like you don't look at people the same ever again it turns you into a nasty person because the longer yeah. you're there you have this little niggle in the back of your head that's like fire me yeah do it fire me what are you gonna do you haven't got the staff fire me um yeah. because you just you hate it so much but i have colleagues that absolutely love their job and like i love this colleague to bits she's like my work mum she's amazing but she loves her job so much and it's baffling. I don't get it at all. It's really, really bizarre. It attracts some of the nicest people, weirdly. I've, I yeah. too have met some people who have felt like family and you just think, you're too good for this place. And they're like, oh, yeah. I, I like the people here though. So I love 
some of the staff. I mean, a lot of the staff I, I used to love. Yeah. But it's just the management and it's just the treatment and the position that you're in. What a horrible, yeah. what a horrible reality. Yeah. Any of you guys seen the Draftsman podcast? There's a guy on there called Marshall. Now, it's not going anymore. It's finished. But he used to sit when... Uh, when Stan, who was the other guy on Draftsman, would go off camera, Stan would, uh, Marshall would sit there and sing. And he'd also talk about how much he liked eating fruit. So I thought I'd take this opportunity to eat a grape. Beautiful. Such big grapes. But it's a two by grape. Could be a one by book. I thought I'd take the opportunity to Eat a grape just like Marshall used to eat an apple. And I was going to sing to you, but our version of Stan, as I've just explained, or Jamie, is back. So I'm going to stop this. I'm still eating a grape. Yeah, so there we go. Excuse my eating. I but... missed that whole segment. <laughs> I had to go for a wee. <laughs> I so want to be the Marshall. I mean, that's partly the inspiration for the length of the hair is the old videos, videos of Marshall. I don't know if you've seen them. But when no. he was young, he was like me, balding, but he also had long hair. And Marshall's a bit of a hero of mine, being that he's such yeah. a drawer. So yeah, anyway, ode to the draftsman. Okay, so now we are going to talk about um, things to help try and like stay positive or get into more of a, a positive mindset i suppose um do you want to go first or should i go first well i was gonna start if you don't mind me going first with yeah what i just did on the camera which is being silly and it may seem <laughs> weird but i think being silly and allowing yourself to be silly is a yeah. good thing it's a good thing mentally for, for your mental health and for your emotional health to be able to have fun and do silly things that are, you know don't have to be so meticulously worked out or whatever yeah. just to add this element of play into your life because if you lose that then you've lost that ability to kind of break out of the conventions and the pressures and the responsibility and the expectations. <sighs> Sorry, since I've quit smoking, I've got a lot less lung capacity anymore. So the expectations was the last word. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, I think allowing yourself to be silly is a really healthy thing. Now it can be hard and I'm just going to expand upon this a little bit because people may be thinking, okay, if I'm feeling down or negative or depressed, the last thing I'm going to do is go, rup, 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 I'm going to be silly. You, know, just, you just don't want to do it. But yeah. if you can ever find a space where you feel safe to be silly, where you can either just think of silly things in your head or play a game that's kind of, you know, something which, I mean, I, I'm not a gamer, so I don't really know what that is. But um, for me, it's usually voices, doing silly voices. Bears, and bears versus baby. And bears versus baby. Very, yep. Yeah, very silly game. You build your own bear monsters to fight armies of babies. Oh my god, that's amazing! I've never heard of that. That's incredible. Yeah. So yeah, that's great. That's exactly what I'm talking about. It's just something where it's, it's absolutely absurd, and it's only for play. Yeah. And it's only for kind of you know being silly. I just think that's really worth something. Um, like yeah. I said, I used to do it with voices, especially when I worked for the dental laboratory. I'd spend the whole day in a car on my own, just driving around country lanes. I mean, I loved it, not because I was on my own, but because the landscape in North Wales is beautiful. And I'd be just driving around thinking about painting and drawing everywhere that I'd go. And when I'd get to the place, I'd draw a little bit whilst I was waiting for the teeth to arrive. And then the people yeah. at the reception would see the drawing and we'd talk. And then I'd pick up the teeth and I'd be, you know, take the teeth to the car and then you know and it's kind of like when i was in the car i would either sing or i would do silly voices and do conversations between made-up personalities and um and that was kind of just being silly for the sake of having an outlet for yeah the internal madness you know and i kind of i need that sort of outlet sometimes so that little marshall vandruff ode to him eating a grape because he used to eat an apple was my uh, introduction of a bit of silliness um, which, however you can do it, 
if there's a way for you to be just playful, you know, not necessarily silly, but playful and kind of have a bit of fun, that's a great way of getting rid of all these serious negative thoughts that impose themselves upon your mind and your heart. One of um, one of my tutors put it really well. Um, he he was talking about the idea of play while you make art, and he was saying that like as kids, you know, we'd play with like trucks and stuff like that. And um, I'm not sure how true this is, but his theory is that um, a fair few artists like it started off in early childhood, where instead of playing with toys and trucks, you'd draw characters and stuff like that, and you know like silly little animals and he was saying that the idea that artists play starts from their early childhood like some people they just stopped playing with trucks and stuff like that whereas like we'd continue to draw and paint and you know make things um so even if it's playing through art using a new material that you've never used before and doing silly things with it um that could be a good thing as well like exploring something new and just having fun with that new thing absolutely that's a real crossover that i hadn't really thought about is that the silliness yeah. in the play is really how you feel when you're using a medium that you're not used to you know if you're yeah. using watercolor and you've never used watercolor you'll want to splodge it because you'll just be like I don't know how to do this and it looks so delicate I'm not going to be delicate just to get rid of the anxiety yeah. of ah it's so fiddly and just to stop that and just to kind of get out of it sometimes you want to do the opposite so absolutely yeah I get what you mean with that it's a great example yeah yeah great. Brilliant. one of the things that um has helped me and like it's going to sound cliche because I was one of those people that didn't believe it trust me I was but exercise for me has been a really good one and I don't want to like shove exercise down your neck because I'll admit I was one of those people that would be like oh how's that supposed to help with my mental health you know um but after my mum had passed away I started to do yoga and I noticed that <laughs> I started to kind of crave it so if I if I'd have gone like a few days without doing yoga, I just want to do it again because I enjoyed it. Um, it's a really good way for me personally to ground myself and be there in the moment because I'm so focused on like um, getting in the right positions and you know making sure that I'm not hurting myself while I'm doing it. Um, and it's the same with like um, trying to do meditation and stuff. I I've never really been good at that um, because. My ADHD doesn't like it. Um, my mind is constantly racing. Um, but the two things that have helped me with that have been when I paint and during yoga. Like the my mind is like a tumbleweed. Um, there's nothing going on, and that's been really positive for me. And I know that some people, um, it's an it's an actual thing. Some people don't get that rush of endorphins after the exercise, so they don't get that happy hormone. Which I think you're at a complete disadvantage, and I'm so sorry, yeah. um, because that that is awful. Yeah. Um, but you never know until you try. Um, I'm not saying like go run a 10k marathon, <laughs> even if it's just you know gentle stretching in your home um dancing um even if it's just you know close your curtains put some music on dance in your front room and be silly that way um it's better than you know nothing or going out for a walk when it's nice outside and instead of listening to music just listening to the birds and the animals just trying to be there in the moment um i explained this when i did my peer mentor training as one of because um, I had to do like this coursework stuff. Um, for those that don't know what peer mentoring is, um, I'm a peer mentor for a mental health charity. So I work alongside the caseworkers doing group work and stuff like that. Um, so I'm qualified as a mentor. Um, and one of the things I spoke about was getting outside in nature and kind of losing yourself in that. Because when you're out there walking, you know you might see a bird or a rabbit and they don't have they have no idea what you're going through they they'll like they won't know but they're just living in the moment 
they're mm. they're they're living, they're finding food, um, and you know, just the the bird song. It's like our issues to them are insignificant, and j just realizing that and being around them. And like I love rabbits, they're so cute. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> makes me smile every time. Like little fluffy bunnies. <laughs> but they're just, you know, hopping along, minding their own business, yeah. having a great time. And I think that's really important, just going out and being around other animals that aren't people. Yeah, absolutely. I must admit there was a point where you were talking about doing yoga and it made me realise that activities uh something which when you try to discuss it there are certain limitations on language which all i mean is that yeah. sometimes language can't describe things fully sometimes language can describe things but it's become tainted and what i mean was i wanted to say that doing yoga starts to become part of a lifestyle now the word lifestyle is kind of a bit cringy yeah. and i think it's really become tainted by corporate usage you know because they'll be like hey this is part of my lifestyle and it just tries to sell you a brand as far as like that's yeah. who you are you're a gillette person or whatever and it's kind of like you know trying to sell you on a product as if like you're going to live the lifestyle of someone who drinks this or uses this product so i didn't want to use the word lifestyle but what i mean is that when you do things like yoga you're all of a sudden a yoga person and that again sounds terrible it's the limitations of language but what i mean is you're engaging in that activity and you're interacting with it not that it's got agency but i just mean that it is something which is out there that you can either go and meet and do and interact with or not yoga is going to exist with or yeah. without you but if it's there for you it's not there against you and it's kind of if you engage with it you get so much nice interaction. I used to do yoga. Yeah. I'm not great for exercise these days, but um, when I do certain activities outside, which is rare, but when I do, I'm reassured that I'm not crumbling and falling apart from very rarely being outside. But I'm also yeah. get that boost of, you know, I've just been out and contributed and done something, you know, either to just like the yeah. environment or to, you know, the kind of property or whatever you know it's just kind of like doing something where you've done something where otherwise there was nothing yeah you know it's, it's literally mean, it, that simple like I'm you know you don't have to go out to a yoga class for instance like I started this during lockdown I have a yoga mat in my house I will literally roll it out onto my front room floor um, and there's an app, it's called Down Dog for anyone that's interested. Um, a lot of the time it is very discounted. They are really good with it. I think I pay like £11 a year and you get five apps. One of them is yoga. There's HIT, high intensity interval training, prenatal yoga, bar and running. And with Down Dog, because I, I can't do it on YouTube videos, I'm not good with that. But every single time um, you start a new session the sequence changes it it completely changes so you're not doing the same thing over and over again and it's really like you've got all the different types of yoga that you can do you've got different boosts that you can do different levels so you're not being thrown into the deep end essentially like if you wanted to do it on beginner one just to get your body moving so that you can work up that's fine as well like you don't have to be a gym buff, you know, yeah. and buy like loads of really expensive clothes to go and get sweaty in a gym. You can do it in your home where you're not around other people and it's just you. Yeah. And you, you know, it takes away from that insecurity of being judged because the only person that's watching is you. Yeah. Um, and even with things like that, you need to be kind to yourself when you do it. Because I remember when I first started. I'll admit, I got frustrated because there were things that I couldn't do. But over time, it gets easier and I'm able to move my body more efficiently now and I'm able to do certain hand balances and, you know, stuff like that. It's just setting mini goals. Um, you can also adjust how long you want to do it for. So even if it's five minutes and, you know, go in five minutes a week to ten minutes um and then changing the the levels that you want to do and stuff like that um 
I'm not saying that you have to announce to everyone that you do yoga because I don't. Like there have been times where I haven't been on the yoga mat for a few weeks because I don't feel like I'm in the right headspace too and that's okay as well. Like give yourself breaks, don't overwork yourself because you'll hurt yourself and you don't want to do that. But even, you know, just the smallest amount of exercise can be beneficial even if it's just going for a walk around your street and then coming back home um and then piggybacking off that a companion yeah just a furry little friend i have two cats i love them it's a bit the white one he's a bit we don't talk about him because he just wheezes on the floor but like you know if if you have a dog go for, you know, a little bit of a longer dog walk or something like that. Um, because when you're alone in your own home, sometimes it can be quite isolating and just having that other... That's all right. Slight technical difficulty, camera died. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, you know, going on a dog walk um, because Having that small little furry friend, or even if you like fish, you know, and you've got a small little fish tank. Um, I do like fish tanks, actually. Yeah. They are quite, um, you know, just watching them go around. Um, yeah. It's It makes it easier because you have this small little thing that loves you unconditionally and depends on you. And um, my cats have been really good for it, where if I'm down they will just come and cuddle up to me because they know that I'm not okay and that does make it a little bit easier so I think that's that's quite important if you're not able to get a dog um, because your landlord doesn't like pets you know get a small fish tank yeah yeah they're great a little goldfish yeah I mean, I've got a fish tank but I have a bottom feeder in the tank and that's all I've got which unheard of no one has just a bottom feeder but She's not, she's not social. She's very antisocial. She's very territorial. So she even doesn't like me being in the room. So I've got <coughs> a fish that doesn't like me. But we are, we kind. I kind of love her for that. She's great, and she yeah. can see me from across the room, which is amazing. Because if I do that to her, she kind of like you know wiggles and looks as if to be like, "What are you doing in my room?" <laughs> you know, she thinks this is part of her tank. You know, which is dead cute. So yeah, yeah. I can relate. I mean, one more thing I wanted to say about the yoga uh, point you were making is that it is uh, non-competitive, which I think is great. Yeah. It's why I used to love skateboarding, is that it's not you're not in competition with anyone, you're just trying to have fun. And I just love the fact that if you're a, a street skateboarder like I am, you don't have to pay to get uh, you know into a skate park. You're not wearing pads and helmets, which you should wear pads and helmets, I suppose. I never did, I never liked that. <laughs> but you feel like kind of a rebel. You're out there trying to grind or trying to ollie over or trying to just ride around on stuff and people don't like yeah. it they don't like the sound they don't like the look of it and you feel like a bit of a punk rock rebel going out there and screeching away on your wheels and there's something really nice about not doing any harm and still feeling like a bit of an outlaw <laughs> you know it was just yeah. some real uh, therapy for me because I was a bit of a troubled child where I'd be just naughty for naughty's sake and the skateboard really made it something where it was again a non-competitive non-destructive i'd say thing even though other people would say so i don't i really don't think we did that much harm or that much damage and yeah it was really it was a nice social uh, aspect to it where you'd meet other people and you'd learn things together and you'd do events and you know just different um yeah, different kind of nights out or kind of days, you know, because we do skateboarding nights, believe it or not. So similar to yoga in a way that it's non-competitive and there will be a community out there. Which, uh, yeah. Yeah, all great stuff. So exercise is a great one, but one thing that you did mention, which um, I thought, again, was uh, a good segue into the next positive, the way to get yourself out of a negative um, headspace is to be kind to yourself it was you mentioned it yeah. early on you'd saying like you know as far as being kind to yourself and it is important it can it seems like a small thing or it seems like a hard thing to do when you're really feeling down 
the little things you can do to be nice to yourself are they're really important they're really good for you to get out of that negative spiral and it can be silly things it can be um things like i don't know it can be like health and hygiene things it can be kind of you know grooming your your hair or you know getting dressed up a little bit or things like that where you kind of making yourself feel better about who you are or yeah it can be silly things like i want to watch this show which makes me laugh and or that i find just interesting and i'm engrossed with and spend a day just gorging on this show and that can sometimes be non-productive but if you're constantly pressuring yourself with the responsibilities you have you may just need that yeah. break and that can be the break that you take in order to be more productive the next day than you would have been without that uh, indulgence so being kind to yourself can be in different different areas but it doesn't matter what it is even if it's you know unhealthy food if it's in moderation and it's just as a treat to say i just want to treat myself i'm just going to make sure that i have these little snacks or drinks or whatever it is that you like to have just as a being yeah. kind to yourself like you're your own friend who's trying to gift yourself something good to have that makes a difference i think yeah. one of the um the things that i found that really helped me with um being kind to myself in that aspect is that 10 percent is better than zero percent so instead of committing to 100 percent of a task which could be taking a full shower mm. you know um 10 percent of that could be just washing your face yeah. or if you can't bring yourself to brush your teeth and you have mouthwash just mouthwash mm. um if you can't get in the shower to wash your hair dry shampoo um if you can't bring yourself to cook a full meal have some like some kind of snack um because it is always better than nothing mm. and i feel like a lot of people struggle to understand that especially the people that i've come across where they'll be like oh well that's not exactly you know um enough or it's not healthy but it is enough because any more than that and you know you're asking a lot of yourself especially when you're down because like there are times where i i can't bring myself to cook a full meal yeah. so I'll have some fruit that I've got or, you know, I'll have some crisps or a cereal bar because that is always better than nothing. Yeah. And anyone that says that you should be doing more is wrong because yeah. if you're not capable of doing that 100%, it is perfectly okay yeah. to do less than That's because it's better than not at all. Because it's, it yeah. it's, it's that or nothing. Sometimes if it's like... yeah. I'm going to judge myself for not doing the full amount or I'm just not going to have it. Having that non-judgment yeah. area where you're like, I'm going to have some of something, that's so much better than saying, no, yeah. I should do a proper meal because this judgment and, you know, kind of trying to regulate how much you have of things because it's something where it's something to do with discipline or, or an upbringing or yeah. an expectation. It's just an unhealthy thing to do to yourself when you're not, you're not kind of uh, managing these tasks as well as you normally do. If life can be overwhelming, yeah. give yourself a break. Like, be good to yourself. Be nice to yourself. Yeah. yeah. And like with um, my ADHD, sometimes I am hyper-focused and I forget to eat. And I look at the time and I know that my partner is going to be home from work soon and will be having dinner. But I haven't eaten and I'm hungry. I won't make a full meal because I know that he's coming home soon, but I'll have something just to keep me going. And um, I used to really struggle with an eating disorder um, and to kind of to kind of treat myself better when it comes to that, I instead of not eating at all because that's what I used to do, um, it's really unhealthy and just to anyone, if anyone has an eating disorder, like please try and get help. It's like I know it's hard, but like it, it's not it's not good and I understand why people have it because I've I've got one um but getting help even if it's from a friend you know it's better than nothing at all um the one that was worse for me was my anorexia so I would only 
I'd only eat like one thing a day and to overcome that I started to have small bits throughout the day and kind of work on it to build up to you know full meals or at least somewhat better than before and that's that's good progress small steps is still good progress um one of the things that i like to do as well because um i have this side of my brain um i call it a very bad name um because it's horrible um and when i have like these negative thoughts about myself i it's taken a lot of work to get to this point but i try and I try and say to myself like if I wouldn't say this to my little brother or my friends or my partner why am I saying it to myself like if I if I wouldn't stand across the room from the people that I care about and say these things what makes it okay for me to say it about myself because it's not okay and I understand that it's harder to hate yourself um, because you know we have to live in our bodies for the rest of our lives we have to deal with us on a daily basis and that's yeah. hard yeah. Um, but you have to you have to try and be kind because at the end of the day you're still a person um, and you're capable of doing amazing things everyone is yeah. regardless of anything everyone is capable of doing something great so when you have these negative thoughts think about the person that you care about the most if you could say it to that person, fair enough, I suppose. <laughs> but if you couldn't, please don't say it about yourself. Yeah. Like try and try and um, try and think that they are the person you're talking to, because yeah. you wouldn't want to hurt them like that. So you shouldn't be hurting yourself that way either. That's brilliant advice. That's amazing. I didn't really consider that, but yeah, the, the amount that we punish ourselves and we abuse ourselves mentally yeah. and talk ourselves down from things. We're our own worst enemy in that way and at the worst times. So, yeah, that's a great, great point to bring up. I mean, there's a lot of ways that we can undo our own positive steps that we take and to try and find fixes of that. I mean, people try to reinforce things like mindfulness, which is great for a reminder that if you can focus on where that thoughts come from, then great. But if you can't focus on where that thoughts come from, you've not got that tool or if you don't want to adopt that exercise you know because sometimes you may know how to use mindfulness yeah. but because you're feeling negative you just don't want to use it you'll throw away a lot of the tools that you have in order to help yourself out from you know this trench that you're in and that's part of being in a slump and so whatever it takes to try to use any elements of these things Obviously, there'll be loads more that we're not mentioning, but these types of things are great to remind yourself that you are experiencing something that's temporary. And this kind yeah. of negativity feels like it's going to last forever. It always does. It never feels like this is an hour long negative moment or this is a day long. It's never usually a whole day, but if it is a whole day, then yeah, it's a bad day. But in the grand scheme of the week or the life, or you know even just the month that day is so insignificant that you've just got to get over that that's the challenge and that is the hardest part and getting over it is the biggest achievement so having some of these little get outs are the most important thing i mean as a as a kind of obvious one because we're obviously art students and art makers art making is a thing which can make you feel better it can make you feel worse yeah you know sometimes if you go i'm going to draw something and then you're drawing something terrible and you're like i can't draw anymore or i'm going to paint something oh my god i've just wasted paint on something that doesn't even look good and those things can go wrong so you've got to have the mindset of i'm doing this for the process and not for the product which i know sounds yeah. like a, just a slogan but it's, it's literally a thing as far as the product is the outcome the process is enjoying the making, enjoying the application of either marks or the paint or the mixing. Those things need to be the focus and that needs to be the point where you know that is for your indulgence and not that you're expected to do something great at the end of it. And usually things work out much better when you take the pressure off the outcome anyway. And if you enjoy the process more 
I mean, I've really found that my drawing is vastly improved when I put in a lot more effort. And it's easier to put in more yeah. effort when I'm enjoying that that time that I'm using, investing in the page or the whatever it is. I need to paint more. Everything that I'm saying is an analogy for drawing <laughs> all the time. And I need to paint more. I've been thinking about paint a lot. Um, but yeah, so I would say art making is another great way out of feeling down. I mean, for me, it's little bits of art making because of having so much work that I feel I'm late with that if I just do tiny little chunks here and there, I know that I've got those little starts in different areas. Yeah. So I feel so much better about that work just because I'm like, I've done that and I'm not doing nothing otherwise. It's just that I haven't added it to the pile of things that I can call work because usually it's just how you present whatever you normally do that can be presented as work or submitted as work and um, a lot yeah. of the time that's just a case of organizing and arranging those things into a presentation so that you can say this is my process or this is my routine or whatever it is that's the hard part but if you can make a start on any of these things that's going to help immediately the weight lifts the judgment you know recedes and you just become a brighter and happier person almost immediately yeah. in my experience one of the um the things that i i personally haven't done um but i've heard that it's it's quite a good thing to try and do is um even if you're not in a negative headspace um try and get into the habit of writing down one good thing you did so even if that's brushing your teeth you know something small it could be anything one positive thing that you you did in a day so then when you're in a bad headspace you can look back at all of the things that you've done before because we focus so much on the negative stuff that has happened and we kind of forget about the good things yeah. so you know it, it could be anything like um I know that one of mine for me would be that I went on a date with my partner and we had a good time but it's you know it's so that when you're in that negative headspace and you feel like you've achieved nothing and you feel like you're worthless because everyone has these thoughts you can look back and be like well no actually I have achieved these things and it's okay if I can't achieve it today yeah. because you can still look back and remind yourself of all of the positive things that you've done before um and it might help it might not let me know in the comments um <laughs> <laughs> but you know you never know um it might be a good thing to do um my therapist also isn't going to be happy with me saying this sorry <laughs> um but sometimes avoidance is a good thing so if you are in a negative headspace try and find something to distract yourself with because sometimes when you're in those head spaces you can't process why you're feeling that way and you end up getting stuck in just like this negativity circle of i feel down but i don't know why so if you try and distract yourself you can then process it afterwards and try and figure out what caused it or even if there was a cause so sorry neil um <laughs> sometimes avoidance in my experience can be a positive thing yeah. as long as you're not using it to avoid absolutely everything and you know it's just like when you're in a slump it can be a useful coping mechanism yeah. i feel yeah no that sounds fair i mean a couple of things is to not take little things that you're doing for granted um so anything good yeah. that you have done to not just shrug it off and say, yeah, but I do that anyway. That's a good thing that you do, even if it's a small thing. And the whole confronting yeah. things, you know, being able to avoid things sometimes is, again, like you said, you're able to process that subconsciously while you are concentrating on something else that is less stressful for you. So I, yeah. I mean, I'm not a therapist and I'm not, you know, even familiar with uh, any therapist. So I'm probably not a friend of them to say this, but that sounds perfectly healthy to me to use avoidance in strategic times to de-escalate yeah. stress yeah, so, yeah. Good stuff. okay okay. Is this okay so final thing for me i think um i don't know why i left this one until last because it's pretty obvious i feel um is communication um 
like whoever is in your support network be that a friend a partner a parent you know <clears throat> anyone try I know it's hard because in the moment you don't want to and I experienced this the other day I was not happy and I struggled to tell my partner what was going on but try and close that gap and communicate with them about how you feel and what's going on in your head because we like to think that people are mind readers and they're just not okay I've never met anyone that can read my mind I think they'd be quite horrified if they could <laughs> um <laughs> but you know they they're not gonna know unless you tell them you don't have to tell them everything you don't have to tell them the full extent or the reasons why just like a quick message of hey I'm not feeling great today um you know anything like that because the thing that um some of my friends do if I reach out and I tell them that I'm not feeling great they'll send me cute animal videos or like funny animal videos just to try and get me to laugh a little bit um and it can you know that kind of positive interaction with someone else yeah. that can recognize that you're not okay and can try and help in any way whatsoever even if that is just sending an a video of a cute dog that's chasing its tail anything you know it's it's so it's better than suffering in silence because when you're suffering in silence you start to feel isolated and alone and then that feeds into the negative thoughts of people not caring. Whereas if you reach out and you're able to communicate with them, you know, they, you start to realize that people do care and they, they want what's best for you and they want to make sure that you're happy just as you would do for them. So even if it's just a quick message of I'm not okay, or like I'm sad, anything is better than nothing which is full circle back to what I said before. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it could be something simple of just, I'm not okay. And then, you know, the other person, hopefully if they're a decent person, um, can, can at least try to be there. And you know, it's, it's another thing with like, in relationships, that's one of the ways that you build trust with another person anyway. Um, so yeah, it'd just be really beneficial, I think. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's it's kind of sharing as well, which is the most important thing. Because when you are inclined to not do that, and to, like you said, suffer in silence, and to just internalise all of the negativity, you're bound by all the limitations of your imagination. And when you're feeling down, your imagination's not working at full capacity. So you're really, you've got a cap to the amount of things that you can actually picture are possible yeah and you know who you are as a person and how others see you and that communication is so key to breaking that open so that's that is an obvious one that i hadn't thought of so when you said it i was just like of course that is should be number one on the list but i forgot what we did as number one on and list. anyone um anyone that is currently in a negative headspace because there is going to be at least one person right now you are not a burden that's true. You're not. Don't, like, tell tell that little voice in your head to shut its mouth <laughs> because you're not a burden, okay? Reaching out to someone else doesn't make you a burden no. in any way whatsoever. So please don't tell yourself that you are because it's not true. That's a great message. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, yeah, you're not a burden. Um, you're valued. You're loved. You're beautiful you're amazing and anyone that says otherwise send me their address and i'll egg their house. <laughs> and then tell them they're not a bird neither they're valued and beautiful and amazing too <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah just try to i have one more thing one more thing really quick which i this was something that i did with one of my exes i thought it was um it was really helpful for me at the time. Um, I'm surprised I haven't done it again. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, me and uh, my ex, we did this thing where we wrote down everything that we liked about each other. So it could be anything and put them in jars. Um, you could do this with friends, um, family, if they're nice. Um, just anyone that you value in your life, 
see if they will get involved with um like do it for each other get small jars or something little strips of paper write down everything that you like about that person and swap so when you're not feeling great you can open the jar and you know take out a piece of paper and look at the things that they've said about you and try to remind yourself of why people want you in their life that's really good yeah that's a great little uh thank you it's not a game it's not a device what would you call it a little activity i suppose a little, uh, yeah therapeutic fix a little life hack well yeah i must say as you can tell i'm very fortunate to have jamie as uh someone to help me stay positive she has always been Thank you. someone who I would say is my studio <laughs> buddy. Doing a podcast with a little gay guitar. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye.